Let us bow our heads, close our eyes, and open our hearts to the Lord's most sacred presence. O most holy and loving one, breathe your divine mystery upon us. May we sense you in this and every moment so that our lives may become a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Christ in our minds, Christ in our hearts, may Christ live within us. Amen. A favorite theologian recounted a story about a man visiting his uncle in Ireland on his 80th birthday. One day before dawn, they went walking along the shores of a lake and stopped to watch the sunrise. Staring at the rising sun, the uncle began skipping down the road. He was radiant, beaming, smiling from ear to ear. His uncle said, Uncle, you really look happy. I am, lad. Want to tell me why? His 80-year-old uncle replied, Yes, you see, God is very fond of me. Now, as we sit here today, how would you respond if I asked you this question? Do you believe that God likes you? Not because you've been told or if it's because it's been written. Does God love you? At times, I assume there's an enthusiastic yes, and certainly there have been instances where we do not know how to respond. This could be one of those times in your life where you just don't know. I had a friend named Jerry who struggled with this question, and he struggled with it because of his life journey. From an early age, he was alone. His mother fought mental illness, and the depth of her torment did not allow for the space nor time for Jerry. His father was a distant figure whose presence only meant abuse or cruelty. Jerry was caught in this cycle where he was constantly attempting to win the approval of those he met, of his parents, and each time he was rejected and then left dejected. I can always remember this image of Jerry late at night riding his bicycle in circles, all alone because there was no place to go. My grandmother would try to pull him into the house and say, come in. And he would say no and ride off in his bike. And you could hear his bike late at night. And that became the pattern of his life. He was pushed out. Then he was alone. And when people would reach out, he would move away. Because when he opened his heart, it was usually broken. If he pulled close, he would push away a constant roller coaster of up and down, and like those late nights riding his bicycle, he would move away. He felt that if there was an openness, then there would only be rejection. The possibility of love meant the inevitable pain and hurt that he felt came with it. His life, as I said, was one massive scar tissue. Yet he was a good person, a beloved child of God, and he loved to laugh and he loved to joke around. But we know what happens in situations such as these. Pain that is not transformed is transmitted. Eventually he withdrew and his heart seemed to close. He went through a series of relationships and those that tried to love him or get close to him, he would push back. He felt like an unrecognized orphan. In our gospel today, Jesus is reminding us of the profound transformational truth. And I want you to take a moment to listen to these words that are in the gospel and break them up. If you love me, you know the Father. He abides with you and in you. I will never leave you as an orphan. I am coming to you. 
I will love you, and I will reveal myself to you. Love. Isn't it almost impossible to comprehend the depths in today's world? Because the word is often used so flippantly. I love this new iPhone. I love that restaurant or this movie or that new car. I love it. And at times, it becomes a word like all the other words we string together. And if we hear it from God, does it grab you by the soul, grab you in the heart, and change and transform you? God's love. Maybe we're like Jerry at times, and we push back to avoid pain and rejection. Or maybe we feel that we don't deserve love. Even the love of God. And when we feel like that, imagine the beautiful eyes of this Jesus Christ, this Jesus of Nazareth, holding all your emotions and saying those words we just heard, I will never leave you alone. Jesus saying those words to you. This God, this extraordinary Jesus that we follow, is always going back to the source in the gospel. He's going back to God the Father. Because there is a knowing that at some point in our lives, we have all been deeply hurt. It could be spiritual, physical, emotional, relational, or even institutional. We have all felt a sense of isolation and detachment, and we're wandering lost in the world feeling orphaned by those we love and by God. Yet we know we long deep inside for acceptance, for oneness with others like this community, and especially oneness with the divine creator of all things. Jesus shattered all images and crashed into this world to show us the heart of God. Jesus continually reaches out to bring us back to the heart of God. God is shouting through all time, throughout all the galaxies and heavens, saying, I love you and you are worth it. In Acts, we're reminded that we live and move and have our being in God. We are his children, but we push back again and again. We push back against love. We push back because we don't want to be hurt. And who can blame us? When you have been wounded, the last thing you want to show is vulnerability. When you are hurt, you do not want to open yourself to the possibility of pain. It's much easier to build those walls around us and be protected than to go forth with an open heart. So we go through life like my friend Jerry, riding alone in the darkness, away from God, away from the invitation. But I want to tell you, our faith is unlike any other that has ever been known. It is radically based on the inclusive and compassionate vision of Jesus Christ. Not what you achieve, not if you complete all the challenges. Our faith is not some divine episode of Survivor Island. We often miss the gospel by 18 inches from our head to the heart. When we keep Jesus in our heads, Jesus becomes manageable. He's easy to rationalize and explain. Yet in pain, there's no real explanation for a God that fills the emptiness of isolation or our deepest sorrow. He comes to you and you are not alone. A theological discourse on the resurrected Jesus Christ cannot cover the horror or tragedy or provide peace in the wake of death or abandonment. Healing is made real through Jesus Christ. Love. It begins and ends with love. It is the difference between knowing about God and knowing God, worshiping at a distance or experiencing the resurrected Christ. But there is one thing missing in this divine relationship. You. Me. 
We know that a relationship takes two. So the question is posed, is God very fond of you? It requires our participation because from before time we are loved. God reaching out and reassuring our divine parentage. James Weldon Johnson wrote, this great God, this loving God, is like a mammy bending over her baby, kneel down in the dust, toiling over a lump of clay, till he shaped it in his own image, then he lovingly brew into it the breath of life. And we, we become living souls, and we are loved and loved and loved, and so I say amen, amen, and amen. That realization is profound, liberating, and transformative. No longer are we chained to our past or our rejections, but we have to give up, turn over, and open our lives, our hearts, and our vulnerabilities to Him. When that happens, this is where the healing begins. This is our life and our true self because all of you are beloved and beautiful. Before you ever took a breath, long before the world began, you are the one God loves. Lives change and your life changes. When illness slams you out of nowhere and you are hurting, you are not abandoned. When the one you love abandons you, God speaks whispers, you are not alone. When death enters your journey, God takes your hand and holds it tight. And if you are a teen and you feel isolated and pushed aside, if you have lost your job, or if you not offered the job you wanted, Jesus is saying, I am not leaving. You are mine. Love. And then what happens? It changes you. You take the hand of the neighbor, stranger, or someone completely different and say, I will not leave you alone. And you are not alone. You can throw away every theological book that ever existed. And if there's ever anything I want you to take away from church, it is this. You are loved unreservedly, unconditionally, by a God made real in Jesus Christ. No exceptions, no presuppositions, you are loved. That is the most profound and important theological statement you can ever take with you. Remember that, because you are beautiful in the eyes of God. It will change your life. It will cover a multitude of sins that will redirect your life. It will pull you close. My friend Jerry stumbled along for a long time, and he finally, finally took a chance. He told me that one day, after pushing back at God for years, he could not stay away. He did not like being alone. So he sat in the back of a church just like this and broke down in tears. He read the gospel again and again, and he focused on love, and it made sense. And then he turned his heart over to a church, a community like this, and love was made real through people just like you. He is now married and has five kids, and each day he is learning how to love and how to be loved. He is not alone because love feels, it heals, it strengthens, and it draws you to the heart of God. So today, as you leave this place, after these beautiful confirmations and this community of hope. Step out of the doors with a knowing that you're never alone, a knowing that there is a God who lived for you, died for you, and each day pulls you close. So smile, greet people with a knowing in your heart, skip, jump with hope, and say, God is very fond of me. Because it is true, my brothers and sisters, God is very fond of you, and your life will never be the same again. So go, love, hope. God is very fond of you. Amen.